Okay, hello everybody. This is an introduction of, uh, to our AT&T's Agile journey. Uh, I am Andrew Lisick. I am the Director of Development at AIC, and uh, what that entails is we have a community development program. We have a product uh, development program, which is called AIC Integrated, uh, AT&T Integrated Cloud, and then uh, we have an automation program, and those three areas fall under, our, under myself. And, uh, Little background on myself, I have about 15 years of uh, experience leading emerging technologies and uh, agile implementations. Uh, at at and I've been focused in emerging technologies and uh, into leading our agile transformation. Uh, to my right here is Jared Stein, and I'll let you him introduce himself. Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for showing up. And uh, I know it's late on a Thursday, so it's good to have you here. Um, my name is Jared Stein again. I have over nine years of experience. Uh, I started back at AT&T about three years ago, and uh, I've been focused on CI/CD. And within the last year, we've had a, a lot of movement and progress. And so I'm very excited to talk to everybody about that today. Hello, everyone. My name is Salim Beg. Uh, I've been working in IT field for the last 13 years. Uh, I've had worn many different hats, from developer to tester to operations role to infrastructure. Uh, but my past four years, I've been focused heavily on the CI-CD space. So I've been working uh, on the CI-CD project at at and All right, well, we thought this was important to share with the community was, uh, was sort of where we went from and uh, where we're going, where we're at today and kind of where we're going. We're into the third iteration of AIC Cloud. And uh, the at and Integrated Cloud is an uh, enterprise cloud that's not solely focused on telco, but is uh, really focused on advancing uh, networking needs to enable our uh, VNFs and, uh, within uh, our telco space across the world. And so uh, we're interoperable. We are continually sort of uh, improving uh, for each one of the releases. And there are areas of our platform that we reinvent uh, we've been forced to kind of reinventing as we've matured along with the platform. Uh, we've been able to prove some things out, and we're, uh, we believe that getting past the point of inertia is really important to see innovation. And so, you know, we're always, instead of trying to jump into the end state right away, we are definitely adopting the fail fast methodology of let's get something out there, let's do it at scale, and let's learn at scale. And... Uh, as we, as we do that, let's adjust and adapt for the business. And uh, as you can kind of see, we, uh, our focus is around these different areas that we've laid out in these boxes. And uh, just to speak to some of them, the SDN, enable, and SDN enablement, I'm sure everybody knows AT&T is a, you know, a big proponent of for our, uh, for our goals and uh, normalized architecture. That speaks to our evolution of uh, we tried doing snowflakes for a while, uh, very client-specific deployments. And then uh, as we've matured from one to two to three, we've continued to move towards a normalized share-nothing architecture. Uh, AIC 2.0 had a distributed keystone in Horizon, for instance. AI 3 2, AIC 3.0 has uh, relocalized those components. That would be some examples of how we've uh, made significant shifts. And then the open source space is something that uh, is my other program, as I mentioned earlier. Our Agile evolution's been really interesting in here. I've kind of looked at, uh, you know, I've been an XP guy since uh, 2001 and been uh, adopting those principles and practices and teaching those from uh, my first uh, program where uh, delivering sort of DSL capabilities for AT&T uh, in 2001 and putting that out to the enterprise with an incredibly small lean team uh, doing it effectively uh, with low defect, uh, without hardly any of the tools. There was, everything was very immature at the time. And I think about those days and how difficult it was and uh, it doing it at that little tiny scale. And as I continued to deliver Agile through at and this I looked at as a great opportunity to kind of summit some of my uh, some of my practices and prove they can be done at scale and something is uh, structured as OpenStack. And uh, within AT&T, we have a lot of different silos. So there's a lot of challenges from financials uh, to doing top-down and bottom-up Agile at the same time. Uh, if you guys want some understanding of that, uh, we at AT&T 
went from a bottom up, so teaching the process and practices initially, and teaching Scrum and XP principles, and then uh, top down, they're sort of looking from the finances on down, and then eventually we will meet, and it'll be a complete agile life cycle. But uh, those are the different angles that we're taking on it, and I can attest to it that you can definitely deliver agile software at scale. Uh, following our principles or following the Agile Manifesto's principles, uh, going from a bottom up and uh, letting the top catch up, which is usually going to take a little longer. Uh, what we're kind of showing here is uh, whenever I took over the program, sort of at late 2014, in December of 2014, I stepped into a program that uh, was in a state of evolution from silver lining into its first iteration of AIC. And uh, what we had was sort of misstructured scrums. There was no real agile principles being laid down. Everybody was kind of off doing their own thing. We had a bunch of ninjas on the team and uh, working and fixing and kind of uh, without any boundaries. And you know, we need to bring some structure to every aspect of it. You know, agile doesn't really waste any space or waste any time sort of laying out any principles that uh, that aren't needed. And so once I got everybody to culturally shift to that mindset to say, look, we need a, a source of record. We need to be able to pull and measure our velocities. We need to account for our work all the time, regardless if we're doing a lab administration deployment engineering job or a defect resolution for a production environment or new scope, new capabilities. We need to make sure we're tracking that and doing that in a consistent manager, manner across, a, across our program. Uh, once I sort of got a hold of that and laid the structure down, even then we have iterated continuously uh, every release, every really uh, mid-cycle, I would say, for AIC. Right now we've went from sort of monolithic releases within AIC to, uh, to 2.5 and uh, what we call 2.5 now. And then we've structured ourselves to have one major uplift a year. So. Uh, that means an OpenStack version change, significant reference architect architecture changes. That would be a two to a three, uh, to a four. And then uh, the, within those releases, we have a dot five, which are targeted feature releases, uh, where we look to introduce new capabilities, like adding PaaS layer type of capabilities to, to the platform and rolling that out. And then we have uh, incremental releases within the dot fives or the dot zeros, so 3.0.1 or 3.5.1 where you are looking at hardening the platform in real time. And that's allowed us a, a lot of flexibility and uh, a lot of that churn from the top down to accept those principles. I think at an enterprise, it's as hard to get uh, your funding side of the house and your project management side of the house to start adopting these things. And that, that comes from trust, which obviously is a major principle of our uh, agile skills. And where we're going next is going to be CICD squared. It's something that we have in, in our shop, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail. But uh, what we mean by that is we have continuous integration, continuous deployment, or uh, delivery, which is sort of what we focused on initially, making sure we could uh, institute automation and get everything working and enabling the scrum teams to be more effective, iteration over iteration. And then the other two layers on that are uh, once we became really much better at that, we introduced a continuous inspection and continuous deployment. And that's really what we're working on and enabling now and uh, making significant strides towards that. And I think they're uh, natural progressions of C your typical CICD. Okay, so here's some, uh, I guess, the money shot here with some of the things we've been able to do in a fairly short term. In about 18 months, we went, whenever I in, jumped into the program, uh, there was a Jenkins platform laid out. There wasn't a lot of usage around that platform. We uh, had four manually, job, manually triggered jobs per month. Uh, we're at over 550 now because we actually support a Juno release uh, at 75 production sites deployed, and we're currently deploying 100 sites in uh, Kilo, and we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more here soon. Uh, automated tests, we've got uh, over 50,000 now being executed from nothing before. Uh, things that you just want to see between your, uh, between your sort of unit testing, your Tempest testing, and your, uh, some of the other frameworks that we use, uh, our SDN, we've dockerized most of those things and 
uh, so we could do sort of testing as a service in our deployed sites in a consistent manner, and that's uh, SDN and added some SDN testing in that and a lot of scenarios in, uh, in the Tempest. Uh, merge Git changes, as uh, our Merge Garrett changes, we've introduced Garrett, so the zero is obviously uh, low because of that, but the 11,000 just kind of shows the how the team has continued to sort of adopt these practices, and uh, they're very active, uh, the team of developers. Our scrum team improvement, we've seen over a, a, this is a conservative number, and so it's a 10 times growth in uh, velocity, and we have uh, what we call a normalized story point. It's just a scaled metric that allows us to normalize around that to give us a pretty good view of uh, how our teams are growing. Uh, and how they're doing and continuing to do. And then we've uh, went to manual to everything automated, and that's extremely important to us. So finally, uh, moving in beyond our dev stack, we have uh, went to CICD to introduce uh, our walled garden and our labs deployments, and then we've uh, introduced the continuous inspection. That just kind of lays out what I had mentioned before from our CICD to uh, CD squared. And uh, I'm going to let Jared or Salim. actually Salim come and handle our continuous integration to continuous delivery, what we're doing today. Hello again. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, you must have a, a decent idea about wh what our CICD uh, process is and uh, where it actually fits in our yeah. AIC program. Uh, we have come a long way um, from where we began. So next few slides, I'm going to talk about what is our existing CI-CD process, um, how AIC's approach to CI-CD has been so unique in achieving the results we have achieved so far. <clears throat> so this, uh, this is our uh, main objective. We wanted to have the integration of providing a very stable enterprise uh, CI-CD with uh, providing a flexibility to the community team. Uh, our CI-CD scrum team has blended uh, what we have from upstream community with uh, community development tools to provide a stable uh, enterprise CI/CD. Uh, we maintain, manage multiple main branches, and uh, which allows us to have uh, <clears throat> parallel implementation of different versions of OpenStack. Uh, we also have uh, integrated vendor uh, Cinder plugins and SDN solutions. Um, even though uh, non, mo not mus most of the software and open source are frequently supported uh, for a specific, specific version of uh, OpenStack. I'll go on to the next slide. Uh, this is our 1,000-foot uh, level of what we actually do as a CI-CD process. We have four key areas, uh, starting from code review, uh, code um, mergers. Uh, then we have something called nightly AVT uh, process, and then uh, we have integrated system test. Uh, first, we, uh, first, we fully implement the continuous uh, integration uh, by running all the syntax tests, uh, unit tests on all components, and then we create uh, artifacts on every commit. Uh, we incrementally build out our continuous delivery to automatically deploy our um, reference architecture. Uh, we have made a lot of improvements, uh, and we continue to do so. Uh, in the interest of the time, I'm just going to list out a few of, few of them. Uh, so we have been able to successfully incorporate uh, package dependency verification. Uh, we have been able to uh, make uh, our uh, release automated process, uh, able to uh, lock down on um, artifact versioning, and also uh, unified hardware uh, integrated component uh, uh, pipeline for OpenStack. Um, this is our AIC verification testing slide, so I'm going to touch over the key points. Uh, as you can see, we have four different types of uh, AVTs, uh, but uh, the most important one is AVT Nightly, uh, which runs uh, on uh, every uh, release and uh, trunk branch. It takes anywhere between 6 to 12 hours and uh, starts from, it, it's basically deploying a whole new OpenStack environment starting from uh, building ISO to running automated tests. Uh, we frequently deploy and um, 
uh, verify the latest stable packages by running our uh, AIC uh, verification tests, AVTs for short. Uh, we have enabled on commit integrated deployment testing for all uh, components. And also, uh, we recently have been able to uh, uh, expand into where we are, we have included bare metal, bare metal compute with SROV and DPDG, DPDK uh, uh, support to uh, reinforce our delivery gates. Uh, there are many different, uh, 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 we obviously have found a lot of benefits of using AIC AVT uh, over our dev stack because the main one is it gives us the flexibility to uh, create uh, production-like uh, AIC environments. And also it gives us uh, the ability for us to converge the SDK for both the development teams and um, DevOps teams. So they are able to, it allows them to be able to see their uh, running code with uh, production configs. With that being said, I'll hand this over to Jared Stein. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Andrew. So I'm going to leave this slide here for a sec. How many people here are on the dev side? OK. How many people from the ops side? Oh, OK. So I've got some dev ops people. How many people from release management? OK. Cool. Think about this. One, we don't use dev stack. I know. Crazy. AVT allows us to deploy actual AVTs on top of a very limited set of hardware. You know, at and is running much larger zones than what we're doing, but we're able to do it every single time a developer commits. We've made some limitations, obviously. We've got a couple different types of AVTs that we've written up on the screen. But the thing to keep in mind is that we focus our testing where it's needed. We don't run any extra test cases when we don't. OK, so we've come a really long way. Uh, a little off here. How, how does AVT succeed? How, at the end of AVT, we say this is a pass or a fail, and we promote the code. But how does that happen? It's pretty simple. We have a couple different test, uh, test scenarios that we run through. Um, we actually use a couple different tools. Um, just because of the, the nature of our infrastructure. Our reference architecture requires it. So Tempest, OSTF, Open Stack Testing Framework, which comes from Fuel, and the Contrail Test Framework. But obviously, I just wrote these up here. They're not that unique. What's special? So our Tempest container is a portable Tempest container. So we can actually take that Docker, Rally Docker test container, and run it in our pipeline. We can hand it to the developers to run it on their lab. We can hand it to the test teams, and they can run it in their test labs. They have everything they need to run all the Tempest test cases that exist within AT&T. OSTF? What's that? Our back extension. <laughs> yeah, and our back. If anybody's interested, you shouldn't be here. You should be over <laughs> in the our back meeting right now. But don't leave. <laughs> OSTF uh, is a fuel provided tool, um, and what we've done is extend, extended and expanded, and actually that's where AVT came from. We uh, sort of took the OSTF framework and adjusted it for AT&T's needs. So we actually deploy um, 50 different tests, specifically across uh, 60 what are called test groups. Uh, those are covering both deployment, HA, destructive scenarios. So we're literally standing up AIC, testing it, tearing parts down, testing it again, making sure that over all these scenarios that we were expected to verify, they're still, AIC is still working as expected. It's a functional test case. And then uh, as part of the normalized reference architecture that Andy had mentioned, a um, big, big thing came in, and that's Contrail. And Contrail isn't easy to test. Um, we didn't have any way to test it through OSTF. Um, and we had some thoughts about how we would do it through Tempest, um, but thankfully we were able to work with the Open Contrail community, and um, there's now a Contrail test framework available. And so that Contrail test framework uh, is expanding, and obviously, as you can see, there's a couple highlights there of what it does cover. Um, 
But ultimately, we've integrated this into the pipeline, and it allows us to verify that the contra that's been deployed is successfully deployed. OK, so obviously, we just talked about ABT. We talked about CI, CD. We're heading somewhere. We finished continuous delivery. We are delivering production-ready artifacts every single day. Now, there's a next logical jump, and that is, let's get those into production. Well, let's get those into a lab. That's a key, key part about the progression of CI, CD, and that's why we're really tackling CI, CD squared here. For our deployments, um, we had to really think about where can we automate, what parts of the business you know, are going to have to make adjustments to support what we're trying to do. OK, so this is our mainline branching strategy. It's up on the screen right here. Um, <laughs> we have the CI CD pipeline. It's fully automated. Now let's gain efficiencies beyond our pipeline. Let's gain them in the release process. So every step on here that you see is mechanized or automated. There is no unintended delays added into this process. I am not waiting on somebody to show up and do something. We have tools that will help us get from each point. Now, as you can see, we follow a mainline branching strategy. But in order to ensure the enterprise stability that's required, we do have branches that occur at the time of deployment. That way, if there's ever a situation where I get told, hey, we need a hot fix, I say, go ahead, cherry pick it into the 301 branch. So this is, this is the, the basics of how we get our changes into production. We have pipelines that monitor all the, all the release, production release branches. Um, and then our main focus is obviously on the main or the master, the trunk branch. Doing good. Cool. Okay, so one of the huge challenges in 2.5 was day two operations. So, hey, I got a cloud, now I need to manage it. Oh, we got an update? Okay. Well, <laughs> wasn't so easy. So with AIC3.x and uh, using Fuel9.0, uh, we introduced the LCM Fuel plugin. And what that will do is actually ease the configuration management burden. Um, how does it do that? It deploys uh, an HA puppet master in the control plane. So now we have the ability to, through a configuration management pipeline that's been set up, go in and tweak fuel and have it redeploy all of the appropriate uh, components. And then, um, some of, the, some of the areas that caused some problems um, and really did challenge the team were in provisioning the undercloud. You know, there's not much out there. There's obviously a lot of tools out there, but one of the challenges is how we're provisioning our undercloud. So what we've done is uh, using a, a, a sort of an interesting approach is let's use fuel. And so NOS is actually a tool that, it's actually a plugin inside of Fuel that can perform actions um, to stand up the undercloud. The, uh, this is the basic architecture uh, of how it does that. And, um, it, it pretty much represents and it's, uh, it's going to be replacing what we, what we do to. I can let take it from that. OK. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. Uh, that last slide, uh, let's just go back here. It's something that I'm proud of the team kind of pulling together. It's something that we've been working on for a while. Uh, for AIC 3.0 and 3.5, uh, we are trying to simplify the tool set, the de deployment tool set. We want to do something called like AIC in a box. When you work in a large program or enterprise like ours, you have a lot of people that want a version of your cloud and they want to stand it up in their own labs. We need to be able to make a distributable pa package uh, that deploys within our reference architecture because as soon as we are asked to uh, 
host an environment, they say, well, there's differences between sort of an OpenStack reference architecture and your reference architecture. Can we have your exact bits and deployed in precisely the same manner that you're deploying? Right now, we use some things to do the early provisioning. It's called Apollo. Apollo interfaces with something else, uh, Metal as a Service. And uh, to simplify that and to continue to move us towards a, a single tool deployment model, we introduce uh, Project Nitrous, which uh, is just a play on the word of fuel. And that moves that provisioning into the, uh, into the fuel space and allows us to get to one deployment tool. The orchestrator of this is an Ansible-based orchestration framework called Workflow Orchestrator. Uh, and that was also, he mentioned, there was a difficulty in 2.5 sites deployed with uh, Fuel 6.1 uh, that did not account for consistency management in the cloud. And we used, again, uh, we developed a centralized management controller that uh, lived in a centralized location and can do distributed uh, consistency management, leveraging foreman and things like that across uh, the 74 sites we deployed last year. Uh, this will be open sourced, which is uh, throughout this entire process. We're going to kind of talk about the things that we will be open, so open sourcing. This will be something that will be able to be found out in the uh, and distributed out in the fuel library if anybody's interested in uh, using it. And that's a uh, fuel nine compatible if anybody's curious, which is uh, the Mataka release. And continuous inspection. We talked about this earlier. It's kind of just near and dear to my heart. It's what we've done in all my old projects. So. We introduced it into this project as well, and it found some really interesting results. Uh, one of them is just kind of checking the box. We have identified as we've used fuel and continued to evolve fuel, you have to make sure that the deployment tool itself is scaling. So when we first rolled out AIC 3.0, we found some of the some of the bottlenecks where it was within the fuel infrastructure, and. Uh, and to expose that early on in the development process, we sort of emulated a 200 node uh, environment. Uh, we're working on adding a, a third bare metal node to emulate 300 nodes and deploy it and I actually look for areas uh, within the installer that uh, may flex and kind of adjust those and tune those. That's just allowing us to be a bit more uh, proactive versus reactive, which caught us in an unfortunate situation recently. Uh, the other two, we have Sonar Cube and Fortify SCA. These are uh, two things that, as an enterprise, we use quite a bit. For uh, first, Sonar Cube is something that we've introduced across every one of the OpenStack projects that we leverage within our space. Uh, as you know, we use the MOS distribution, or as I've hinted towards that. So we actually do Sonar Cube analysis on every one of the MOS uh, packages nightly and get the results of that. Uh, there's no reason why we can't do it in, uh, with the community or right on the main line, which we've actually done for my community program as well to expose uh, critical severities in uh, its analysis. Also, it can give you code coverage results and things like this. For a large program or even a small program, Sonar Cube is really nice because you can kind of get a very nice graphical representation of each project and all the way down to the developer and how well they're committing unit tests when they're committing codes of, uh, when they're committing lines of code and really any level of data point you want to get. If you have the right plugins, you can uh, get some exposure into how well your team is applying agile practices. Uh, and then Fortify Source Code Analyzer, it's something that's been like a two year quest of mine to, to work with our CSO department who has sort of uh, let go of some of their space to allow us to uh, refine and tune the, what is the name of the actual centralized platform we just enabled? Cloud Scan, Fortify Cloud Clouds, Scan. Yeah, Fortify Cloud Scan. Uh, that's where we finally figured out we could run 68 repositories in about six hours. Typically, when you run one of the OpenStack projects, you just use out-of-the-box configurations. It takes around like 14 hours to analyze one of those. And what we found is some fairly significant challenger opportunities to fix some uh, vulnerabilities in the, uh, in, the, in the code. And uh, we're planning on using the... Uh, AIC program, uh, community program, to sort of uh, run the report and account for those. Uh, not picking on anyone here. I don't know if this actually calls out. It does not. Good. So this is, um, yes, it does. Uh, oh, this is Cinder, uh, and we did this on mainline, and this is sort of a run, and it resulted in sort of this visibility of where you can kind of see where some of the opportunities for uh, 
a project or a team of people that are just learning maybe or doing some, uh, doing some analysis on a project that want to get their feet wet or do some house cleaning that's going to add some real uh, value to a project, they could come right in, see the export of this on a main line, and they could start opening bugs against the project and start delivering this. We've got some pretty good, uh, while we've been here this summit, we've been promoting this idea to a few of the PTLs, and they've, uh, they've liked the idea of it. And so we should see this being introduced uh, very soon to a handful of projects as we proof this out, and then ultimately want to do it across any projects that are uh, wanting us to do that. Uh, finally, this is, uh, this is it, and we'll open up to Q&A. Uh, Jared, you, gonna, you wanted to make mention that you were going to open the, the builds we're going to get upstream. Oh, yeah. So one of the things that we've been working with is um, so AT&T has a community team. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody got there with that session, but uh, we've been partnering with them, and we will be making um, as much of this pipeline available to the community as possible. Um, that will all be coming through the community team initially. Um, and it's, it's going to be uh, pretty interesting. It, it's all, all, the, all the jobs that we use are they're, they're fully automated. They can be loaded right into Jenkins using Jenkins Job Builder. Um, nothing we use is really any different than what the community has. So you'll just get to see what we've done to do it. So any questions? Go. Yes. 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 Yes, I can. Uh, so in Fuel, so in Fuel 2.5, we didn't have a lot of flexibility to introduce these sort of iterative releases like we wanted to. So we uh, worked together with uh, our partners to develop the ability within code to configure using a config DB uh, what capabilities we wanted to toggle on. Fuel and nine, Fuel nine introduced the idea of a uh, of Modular, modular plugin, so you can actually add plugins that are hot deployable. If you co code it to be hot deployable and flag it to be so, that enables Fuel to redeploy something. And as long as you've uh, made all your underlying puppet manifests uh, idempotent, you're fine as the task graph kind of rolls out and it'll reapply it. And we can define new roles in the cloud as we introduce new features. Uh, LMA would be a good example of that, or Stacklight if you're following it. We did 3.0 without it. We introduced Stacklight uh, within a 3.0.1 release, and that's uh, enabling uh, log stash and uh, the LMA plugin, essentially. Uh, and we were able to do that just through a toggle. I mean, just going to the database and toggling on or off. Uh, down in my OpenStack development teams have introduced that at sort of the OpenStack layer, at the component layer or the project layer uh, with just a simple framework as well. I would actually need one of my developers, which they're not he, here they to use, speak they to use, They just use flags. We have yeah. a naming convention for the flags, and people will set them by default to be off, and the old functionality sticks around, the new functionality is turned on. They can deploy without making any changes. Flag, turn it on when they need to. Any more questions? Come on, try us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes one. Was it a vendor that told you this? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think there is some truth to both of those things. I don't know that we have, we deployed 74 clouds last year, starting in March to the end of the year, using a distribution that was not ready for prime time, and we made it ready for prime time. Uh, we have tenant workloads, we have business critical applications running on there every single day. And uh, we are upgrading and delivering new capabilities into that cloud every day. We have got great partnerships helping us with that distribution. Uh, you don't have to go too far to understand that uh, 
we work alongside with, uh, we collaborate alongside with. Many vendors. Yeah, many vendors. So uh, I, we're not a we're wholly independent shop that's doing everything in ourself with AT&T badges, uh, delivering every line of code. We are, we are dependent on collaborating with other people. And, uh, and as we move into our, our next uh, journey, which will be the AIC 5.0 and a containerized control plane, which is extremely exciting, uh, we'll be continuing to work more, uh, much more tightly within the community uh, and maybe not as reliant on uh, sort of closed distribution solutions. We want to partner with the community. I mean, that's all. That's what we're, we're trying to drive the change yep. back to the community, right? Yeah, that's that absolutely. We do, nothing that we do is special to what we to us. Our goal is to get this back into the community, keep fostering the community itself. You know, nothing's going to be locked into a specific vendor. The vendor should be focused on the community too. We have a reason. commitment to giving whatever we have back to the community. We are not trying to look to build too much secret sauce. You've heard my senior vice president give the this uh, presentation in Austin, and uh, my. AVP is never shy about saying we are committed to driving this community uh, to help the telcos and the large operators and closing some of the gaps that we've identified across sort of five themes. Uh, that goes all the way down to our lowest processes, in which we kind of talked in here. It's, uh, it's helping out, it's doing housekeeping, it's delivering robust, broader solutions. To I think you asked if we also had the expertise to choose the right vendors. Is that, was that one of the questions? Okay, I can answer that. I think we have uh, quite a bit of expertise in house. Uh, we are a massive corporation that is doing things at massive scale across the world, across many regions, which have different rule sets for every one of the production environments you deploy. And also, we're learning on the fly along with everybody else in the community, along with every other corporation that's deploying an OpenStack cloud. If anybody tells you they come in, and they've got to figure it out on day one, and they deploy an effective cloud in production, uh, and then start doing that at scale using some of the technologies we're using. They're difficult. I feel very confident that uh, we have the competency within our company, and within our tech arc, and our research, and our tech dev programs, and our operations programs to choose the right products, to choose the right vendors to help us achieve these massive goals. But we're not afraid of failing fast as well. We do that all the time. Do it all the time. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I won't name any vendor names, but we've also been down the path prior um, where we, we went to a vendor who was highly reputable and would, would tell us that they were the ones who knew how to do anything, and we brought in uh, their people, right? And then said, they told us how to do it. <laughs> Just be, I mean, you, you, Thank you very much, everybody, everybody. Thank you, everyone, everybody. for your time. We really appreciate it. It was great to have you all here. And thank you very much to the team back at home, because it wasn't just us. Obviously, yep. there are a lot of people involved in getting us to where we are. So That's right. Thank you very much, everybody. You and if anybody wants to have uh, closed conversations or anything more in depth are about how to be uh, The deck will be shared. Be happy to talk about it. As you said, you thank you. Thank you.